All right, thanks, Gabe. When Lisa asked me to talk a little bit about Earth Day, first I thought it was a good opportunity for a sh shameful commercial, but she also sent me some history, and I didn't really realize that she wanted a lot of history, so I'm going to focus on myself and how in Earth Day has inspired me and some of the things that I do in my career. I'm going to start off and give you guys a little history. About 25 years ago, I tried to be a Boy Scout. And I'll emphasize try because I was, my mom encouraged me. She was a single mom. I spent all my allowance, all the money I had to, from raking leaves, mowing grass, went on and bought a uniform. I kept the book, but I didn't get a lot of badges or awards. It's pretty, pretty challenging. But the important part of this is, and I'll, I'll share with you something that kind of stuck with me, and I didn't even really realize it until just a few months ago, is that this, this, some of the things you learn in life are seeds have been planted a long time ago. And one of the things that has stuck with me, and I kind of figured it out that when I go through this book, and I dug this up just a little bit ago, there's a lot of little things in here. There's even a section on earth, or energy savings, and it teaches kids how to put a sweater on when it's cold, to shut the door to save energy, to turn the lights off when you're not using things. So a lot of good things in here. But one thing that stuck out is the outdoor code, and I'm just going to read that for you real quick, and then give you a little more information about myself and some of the things I've been doing. The outdoor code goes like this. As an American, I will do my best to be clean in my outdoor manners, be careful with fire, be considerate in the outdoors, and be conservation-minded. I'm going to focus on being clean in my outdoors manners section. It says, as an American, I will do my best to be clean in my outdoor manners. I will treat the outdoor as a heritage. I will try to improve it for myself and others. I will keep my trash and garbage out of America's waters, fields, woods, and roadways. The beauty of our land has been spoiled by tons of garbage, newspapers, tin cans, bottles, and cardboard boxes. Our streams are being choked with trash. The way to stop this plague is for you to join the war against litter. You do this by helping remove the trash that is destroying the place where we live. You do it also by never being a litter bug yourself. So it's these kind of moments that really, I think, like I said, I've just built seeds to develop your personality and your profession as you grow older. And I like a lot of us here, like to think of Earth Day as probably every day. You go to work, you're probably doing something because I'm an environmental engineer, so I'm always trying to change our products or influence someone's decision on how to take a, a certain wage stream at work. But unfortunately, it's not every day. It's not every day that 400 people come out on an idle Tuesday or whatever day of the week in the middle of winter to pick up trash. It's really a, an opportunity for everyone to engage someone who may not have done something yesterday or to, to, to leverage their values about an environmental focus. Well, six years ago, Earth Day for me came around, and I decided that I was going to do something more this year than I did last year. And the previous year, I think I probably just cleaned up some trash that I found in the ditch by my house. <clears throat> but I sent out a personal goal that year, and at our office, we installed a lot of things just focusing on saving energy, and installing occupancy sensors, changing light bulbs, and just asking people to change their practices and turning their computer off at night. The next year, I got engaged with some even more colleagues, and we got the whole office building, because we were just a small office, and encouraged everyone to, to pledge to recycle so that we can convince our landlord to bring in a recycle dumpster. That worked out well, great. Everyone's been recycling ever since, and I don't no longer work there, but I know that they continually do those kind of things. And in a few years back, I started off on a project, and I met Dan from Wemiak at a river cleanup in Grand Rapids with the mayors in the fall, and thought, well, we should do something similar like that. I live in Grand Haven now, on the west side of the state. On the lakeshore, we have a lot of trash, too, that seems to collect in the river. So a few months later, we made, developed a partnership with the Grand Haven area JCs and engaged over 600 people to clean up over 16,000 pounds of trash just a few hours over Earth Day weekend. Last year was great. We've, we've even discovered a dump site the first year, and we went back last year and tried cleaning it up. It's been decades old, piles of trash that shouldn't have been there, and we actually have to go back this year to clean it up. Last year, we also even caught Sasquatch on tape. <laughs> you have to go to the website if you want to believe for yourself, but there's some flyers on the cars and some on the table. You can check it out. <clears throat> it's true. <laughs> I, I was there myself. Right? I won't tell you everything else he does. 
In Laban last year, we sorted enough metal from a partnership that we created from the First Christian Reformed Church in Grand Haven. And they sorted all the materials that we found. Not only did we recycle it, but the metals that we took to pad nose created $350 that were donated to Loving's Mobile Food Pantry in, in our community. So based on those successes, we build on every year. And this year, we're making a big move. We're moving closer into Grand Haven. In the past, we had been out in the middle of the, st in the sticks in the county park. But now we've, we've moved to Harbor Island in Grand Haven. We're going to be hitting sites from Dewey Hill, Spring Lake, and Perrysburg, all the way to Eastmanville. It's like a 20-mile stretch of the river. We do both sides of the drawbridge and underneath it. Now, we don't clean up the whole entire 20-mile stretches, but any places that we know of that's typically populated by public parks or near roadways that tend to collect a lot of trash. We've even had some new exciting sponsors this year. The past couple of years, tires have collected, and we haven't found a home for them. But this year, Bridgetone Tires, for example, is has a program where they help organizations recycle tires and they'll pick them up from a, a, a cleanup like ours or even Muskegon cleanup are also going to be doing the same thing. But it's our sponsors like, like West Michigan Environmental Action Council that help us out, Lisa with the Sustainable Business Forum helping spread the word through email and people like yourself that just who may not be able to take or may not be able to attend to yourself but you can definitely do something you know that, that can engage someone to help us out. So it's exciting for me to really in invite you personally to come out and help out. <clears throat> we need you to show your support. You can, if you can't be there, you can donate money on the website. Or you can just come out and lend a hand or see me if you want to be a team leader as well. There's opportunities to step up and, and, and show your leadership skills or develop, develop them even further. We'll provide everything you need from bags and gloves, even a light lunch and, and bre some breakfast in the morning. So take one of those cards, there's more information on back, you can register yourself or a small team. Like I said, you can even donate online or you can go to the website and discover the Sasquatch for yourself. <clears throat> there's a lot to do next week and the week after, a lot of people celebrate Earth Days a lot of different ways. West Michigan Environmental Action Council also has a clean, um, West Michigan Needs Clean Water, West Michigan Needs Water Earth Day celebration event. There's all kinds of fairs going on if you want something lower impact. I know there's one at the library in Grand Rapids. There's one in Grand Haven. Muskegon's got a whole big thing going on. Bottom line is everyone can do something. And everyone can do something a little bit more than what you may have done last time. If you just simply want to do something like planting a tree or pick up trash in your ditch, all I ask is maybe to you know, invite a child or someone who may have never done something like that before, who you wanted to share some of your values with. You know, it's a pretty simple thing to do. All you got to do is ask most of the time. Thanks for your time. Okay, thank you, Brock. That was excellent. Next up is um, we're going to recognize the essay contest winner from this past year. And um, I can tell you this event is um, it's always inspiring to me um, to sit down and, and think that that so many of you take the time to write down your thoughts and, around sustainability. And this past year, uh, many of you did the same thing and took the time to craft some very thoughtful essays around the idea of virtu virtuousness. Mm -hmm. And so we'd like to recognize um, this year's uh, outstanding essayist. So with that, I'm gonna turn over to Lisa to give you some more detail on, on this year's winners. And just a minute of background again. This is the second year that we're doing this. Uh, last year was our first year. And um, what we've done is, it's turned out really nicely. We've had a special speaker in in January, sort of an inspirational session to kick off our year. And then we use that opportunity not only to, well, to announce the fact that we're hosting the SI contest, but also to frame it so that, that our, the theme is based on that uh, January speaker. So that's turned out really nice. The first year it was based on uh, the book Moral Ground, Ethical Action for a Planet in Peril, and it asked for people to send in their very personal reflections on what inspired them and uh, underscored their commitment in their personal and their business life to a more sustainable world. So again, then this year in January, we had Kim Cameron from the University of Michigan, um, who's done some very interesting, very practical uh, research-based um, projects on the business value of virtue. And so that, that set us off for this year. And that was the theme of what are those things or people in your life um, 
that in, a virtue that inspire you and have added to your own quality of life. So that's where we are this year. And I do want to uh, recognize we have a wonderful, for the second year, a wonderful essay panel that's gotten together, that's helped frame this whole thing, read through all the essays, and then came to these very difficult decisions of who we're going to be um, making the awards to. But I want to recognize Dave Opperly with Bissell Home Care, Shelley Irwin with WGVU, Terry McCarthy with the Weggie Foundation, who's not able to be here today, as well as Brenda Moore from the Grand Rapids Urban League. Sue Powie is not able to be here today either with NTH Consultants. Um, these next people all serve on our board. Dave Renard with Steelcase, Dan Schoonmaker with Weemiak, um, Justin Swan with Organocycle, Gabe Wing, Herman Miller, and Jennifer Womack with Idea Design. So we want to thank all of them for, for their work on that and their dedication to it. And we will be, I just want to mention now, we're also going to be finding some ways to, further ways to recognize the SAS. Um, Shelly Irwin has helped us. We did a nice interview beforehand, and she's going to be interviewing the SAS on her morning show um, coming up soon. We'll be obviously putting them on our website. Class Quant, who's wonderful from Grand Rapids Community College, this is the second year he's taking this program, and we'll have it up on YouTube today. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That's right, I'm on. So uh, that'll be on today. We'll have it on our website as well. We'll have the, the video, but we'll also have uh, all of the essays up. And in addition to that, Kim Cameron with the University of Michigan is going to be putting it up on, uh, on their website, which is wonderful. So, And we will, who knows what other venues we'll find or opportunities to share these things. And um, the essay panel is going to be getting together in another month or so, and we're going to start working on next year. So we will keep you posted on that. But now for the important part of um, this afternoon's presentation, I'm going to start, let's see, with Shelley Irwin. Call her up, and she will get, our, get us off with introduction. Thank you, Lisa. Let's start strong. Your overall, overall winner of, you're all winners, but of this particular essay contest is Michelle Van Houten. Let me share you her story. She's recently been appointed to represent the conservation interest on Kent County's Agricultural Preservation Board as a volunteer serving to foster healthy economic, social, and environmental benefits in our communities by preserving prime and unique farmland. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology from Calvin College. She also holds a Master's of Management degree from Aquinas College with concentrations in sustainable business management and communication. So we know she knows how to write. She's a long-term practitioner of environmental health, safety, and supply chain management who's currently seeking a new career opportunity. She's held positions in the manufacturing, engineering, consulting, government, healthcare, and public utility sectors. Michelle is a master gardener. How's this rain doing for our gardens? Loves to toil in the soil, create landscapes that incorporate sustainable design and creative reuses of materials. She also loves to bicycle. She gets a great sense of satisfaction completing bike rides, such as the Dalmic that winds from MSU up through the rolling farms of central Michigan and through the North Lake Country that, of course, tests her physical and mental stamina, all the while raising awareness for causes close to her heart. We ask Michelle to come on up and read her essay. A round of applause to Michelle, please. Thank you, Shelley. Before I read my essay, I'd just like to take a moment to thank the West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum, its board, and its judges for providing our West Michigan community with the opportunity to think about virtues and character traits of individuals and organizations that inspire us and then to encourage us to write these essays. As I was telling Lisa, you know that writing can be creative and informative, revealing a lot about the writer, or it can be more mechanical in its form like we see in business, scientific, or academic pieces. No matter its form or its purpose, writing can also be challenging 
difficult, daunting, tedious, and aggravating. Yet, writing can be very fulfilling, therapeutic, and satisfying. So I am honored to be acknowledged as the winning essayist by the West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum. I've titled my essay, The Country Cemetery. Perseverance, fortitude, patience, and humility. To those who come to the Little Country Cemetery, these are just some of the virtuous attributes that are chiseled deep into the names etched on the tombstones. These virtues are also spoken of here in the softest of whispers, carried on the winds for anyone who quiets himself long enough to listen. I know, I've heard these whispers. I hear them carried on the gentle summer breezes or in the biting winds of winter that sweep over this parcel of land. Neither scorching heat nor drenching rains dampen them either. They are there for anyone to hear if they pay attention and wish to learn about living where the principles of a virtuous life are central. And I do, so I keep returning to the country cemetery. Nestled under a canopy of conifers and hardwoods, this little spot has become a go-to place for me. Its very setting surrounds me with a warm and comforting embrace. For one thing, it's a pretty place. There are cornfields on one side, an old country church on another, a scenic little road bordering yet another side, and an inhabited old farmhouse edging yet another boundary. The tombstones and grave markers add to the beauty of this landscape too, each with its own distinctive markings. It's also a simple place, remaining steadfast in its purpose. It is what it is. It doesn't try to be something it is not. But like the rest of the world that is ever changing, it too is a place of continual change. But it has figured out how to strike a remarkable balance amidst the demands on it. In fact, it embraces both the old and the new with the utmost of respect. I think that there is a lesson of virtuousness just in that alone, and this is one of the reasons I come to this uh, corner of the country. Its steadfast and purposeful simplicity makes this little corner of the country conducive to quieting me from the noisy busyness of life. Unlike my favorite coffee shop, when I come here, I can actually hear myself think. And honestly, sometimes that's all I need a simple time out. Finally, this piece of land has an inherent beauty that goes beyond its pretty country setting. It's much more than just a piece of prized ground to hold earthly bodies when lives are completed. There is a legacy of virtuous lives here. In all of its outward prettiness and simplicities, it is something more. It is filled with stories of people whose own lives I'm coming to learn were once as complicated and difficult, but nonetheless as sweet and rich as mine is today. You see, this is my family cemetery. It's where four of my siblings are buried. It's where my dad is buried. It's where my aunts and uncles and shirt tail relatives are all buried. It is the burial ground of my ancestors. Here, stories of perseverance, fortitude, patience, and humility are passed down from generation to generation, just like my family's genetic makeup. I wander between the newer and the older sections during my visits, and I've noticed that regardless of their age and placement, the conditions of and inscriptions on the tombstones can tell a great deal about humankind in general. It's all here. Deaths from wars, periods of civil unrest, blight, famine, premature births, horrific accidents, diseases, murders, suicides, and old age. This cemetery is a microcosm of the bigger world, revealing the same heartaches, disappointments, tragedies, and incredible losses that come with life. 
But the inscriptions on the tombstones also tell a great deal about incredible joys and lives well lived. For I've noticed that what has been inscribed onto these grave markers almost always speak of virtues attributed to these individuals. And I hear the whispers gently telling me of character traits that can help me stay the course too, no matter the challenge or the hardship. These whispers are quiet utterances of perseverance, fortitude, patience, and humility. But I ask in response to these whispers, where did these individuals get their determination and courage? By taking on the cloak of virtuous character traits, I hear whispered in the wind. When faced with heartache and despair, most mustered the will to carry on. But how does one gain such strength of character? How does one become resilient? Where does this determination and courage get its start? Can virtuous character traits really make it possible to keep moving forward and to find the good in life? I hear whispers of, don't despair, keep the faith, be happy. So I don't have to look far to find those virtues to which I aspire. All I have to do is come to this little spot in the country, quietly walk around and listen to the whispers. It breathes its own source of life-sustaining oxygen into my being. This family legacy of virtuous traits that is my inheritance is chiseled on every tombstone I walk by. It is through the stories of these lives that I've learned so much about the noble virtues of perseverance, fortitude, patience, and humility. As I wind up my visits, I stop by our own grave sites. We bought them years ago when my husband was diagnosed with terminal cancer, and we were told that we would need one very soon. The whispers I hear in this section almost always get louder, penetrating my ears with a deafening sound. Keep persevering. Remain steady for one another. Be patient and try to be gentle in spirit. These whispers tell me that not only can I learn about honorable character traits here in this cemetery, I can learn about them from the people in my everyday life. For you see, I have seen these attributes lived out every day by my husband, now a survivor of a stem cell transplant that put his terminal cancer to rest. As he prepared for his transplant, he was often heard to say, there's nothing to it but to do it. But he and I knew differently, so sometimes I found his remark for describing to people how we were getting through the sheer terror and the hell of a stem cell transplant to be way too cutesy and far too cut and dry. I sometimes felt that his remark diminished our turmoil implying that the process was way too easy when it clearly was not. Virtuousness can sting when it hits some very raw nerves. Yet most of the time when he'd say it, I could sense that his remark was serving as a source of incredible inspiration and motivation, not only for himself and for us as we journey down this road, but also for those with whom he'd share it. Virtuousness has a way of doing that, too. It became his battle cry, his voice, and it became mine as well. This battle cry fostered support. For him, it was a call to willful action, to put to the ultimate test his belief that perseverance in the face of hardship can make a positive difference, that fortitude takes every ounce of conviction you have, that patience oftentimes requires an interminably long-range outlook, and that humility requires a demeanor of gentleness and acceptance. For me, it became a period of great teaching moments. It was my reminder that these virtues can indeed ensure resolve in difficulties and constancy in the pursuit of the good in life. For if by choosing to embrace these attributes, I can become better for it, then can't a convincing argument also be made that my little part of the world can become better by embracing such virtuous attributes? I know with certainty that these virtues can be difficult to embrace. 
I also know with certainty that they can produce extraordinary results. I know too that I am shaped by many people, places, and experiences, so I find myself appreciating more and more these individuals whose virtues are chronicled here in this simple place. Like the country cemetery that remains steadfast in its purpose, virtue is what it is and it doesn't try to be something it is not. As I walk back to my car, I feel refreshed and renewed. Go now and do your best to live a life where virtuous principles are central, I hear carried on a gentle breeze. The whispers assure me that it doesn't get any better than living a life defined by attributes of virtue. So I do my best to heed their wisdom, knowing that I am well prepared to head back into the complexities of life with all of its messy challenges and oh, so sweet victories. Thank you. Justin Swan with Organocycle. Uh, as one of the judges, I, I can say that uh, Mich Michelle's essay had a little bit of an extra touch that we all appreciated a lot. Uh, and it was, it was great for us to read through many of these. Uh, so thank you, Michelle. Uh, we have two um, other, uh, I guess, finalists or, or uh, runner-ups. Uh, and I'm going to announce one right now. Uh, I also have the pleasure, she's, she's a customer of ours. And she has been the most magnificent customer because she does not hesitate to call and let us know when we need to change something or do something a little bit better. <laughs> so it's been great. Uh, Teresa Hogerhide is an environmental advocate, writer, and locavore in Grand Rapids, Michigan. She works from home using her interior design education and background as remote staff for the U.S. Green Building Council. The council develops the lead green building rating system and certifies the green buildings. She has been writing on the blog www milocalfoodbeat.com since June of 2010. The blog, Michigan Local Food Beat, and its Facebook page are devoted to educating locavores, especially Michigan locavores, and I'll let her explain what that is if, if those of you don't know. Uh, its mission is to educate readers on how to find, prepare, eat, preserve, and enjoy local food. She is a former staff person at the West Michigan Environmental Action Council and served on the Sustainable Business Forum Board as well. She currently serves on the Fulton, Fulton Street Farmers Market Organizational, Organizational Planning Committee, Committee. So please welcome Teresa. Thank you, Justin. And thank you to the committee and the board and all of the Sustainable Business Forum. I appreciate the honor. And uh, my, my essay is, um, was set in February. And a couple of weeks ago, when I was preparing, I thought, wow, are they even going to remember February? But thanks to the weather today, I think you'll all be able to really put yourselves into uh, the essay. From Vine to Virtue. As I step out my door on a frosty February morning, I try to shake off the cold. 20 degrees in Michigan is enough to give many second thoughts, but the anticipation of my destination warms me. I pull my coat collar closer and head to the Fulton Street Farmer's Market, my market. As I approach, the buzz of activity is in view, cars entering the driveway adjacent to the small historic building, a person waiting by the bus stop, a partially built structure set aside for the weekend, soon to be a permanent building to house year-round vending. The winter hardy are here. Those who gather eggs, slaughter chickens, tend to lettuce in hoop houses, or package beans, teas, and soups from dried summer goods. They pull root vegetables out of storage, or they bake all week. And the shoppers, walking, biking, driving, or busing, often with small children in tow, to a winter market for a half-hour connection to Michigan's food system. A farmer's market is where personal enrichment and nourishment meet. Whether the person is a shopper or a producer, just showing up is virtuous. 
The shoppers prioritize their time and their budget to support their values, health, economic, environmental. They show their children what real food looks like, and they look into the eyes of those that produce their food. The farmers get up at dawn to drive our food to market from 5, 10, or 50 miles away. Staff is there earlier to open the market. Over the past 10 years, farmers, the market staff and volunteers, and shoppers have changed each other. Farmers understand that customers want to know how their food is produced. A conversation starts. Community-supported agriculture, where growers and eaters share the risk and rewards of food produ production in Michigan's climate, are now offered year-round. New businesses pop up out of backyards, incubator kitchens, and even the basement where one of the producers grows basil in the winter. The farmer's market management has changed. Relationships rewrite themselves. The vendor committee fosters communication and feedback between management and the vendors, creating a positive relationship. A volunteer planning committee has been convened to move the market to the next level, the development of a mission statement, bylaws, and a board of directors for a 501c3 nonprofit status. The busy, acknowledgeable market staff and volunteers are dealing with increased traffic, food stamps, and debit cards so that we all have access to fresh food. The shoppers arrive weekly rather than occasionally. They ask food preparation questions and bring home a vegetable that they never knew existed. They recognize farms listed on restaurant menus and ask for local brands by name in grocery stores. This influence spreads. Even fast food restaurants lure in customers with billboards stating claims of local food support. As I walk through the market, I see my friends in both producers and shoppers. And I understand that I too have changed. I grew up on home canned food, but due to circumstances, I did not do my own canning until many years into adulthood. Inspired by the taste and nutrition, of local foods, I practiced and gained preservation knowledge. One steamy summer morning, I realized that I had carried home one quarter of my weight in produce. I joined the guerrilla marketing of blogging and social media. I wanted to demonstrate how easy it is to find, prepare, eat, preserve, and enjoy local food. These are the moments when I feel the most useful in the world. A common virtue for producers and consumers is sharing. Food producers graciously tell me their stories, adding dimension to my blog posts. Readers contact me offering to share their bounty or for advice for how to use a glut of an overproducing vegetable. Friends and neighbors ask me to help them to find recipes to deal with a new food allergy or to prevent a health issue. I sometimes spend an afternoon demonstrating how to can food. I don't know how we got tomato juice on the ceiling, but every time I look up and see it, my heart warms. <laughs> on the way home, I think about the producers that I have met over the past three years. One, a man who grew wheat, milled it, and sold the flour as a retirement job. His place was one of my first farm visits. As I gathered pen, paper, and camera, he asked, so what is a blog? One August, I stopped by the Wild Rice Harvesting Weekend, sponsored by the Native Wild Rice Coalition. I experienced the traditional way that food is produced. And I faced a fear of bees by visiting a beekeeper and her, his daughter. I approached my home with my stash of winter greens, fresh eggs, and a variety of root vegetables. The cool winter breeze barely noticeable anymore. Hey everybody, I'm, I'm Jennifer uh, Womack, and as one of the judges who had the pleasure of being involved in this contest for the second year in, the, in a row, I have the, the distinct pleasure of introducing our first repeat offender today. Um, Ann Reynolds 
is co-owner of Stetson Building, LLC, which is a residential and light commercial building and remodeling company. Anne and her husband, Ronald, who's here with her today, founded the company in 1983. Since the beginning, the company has emphasized indoor environmental quality, resource conservation, alternative energy production, and safe job site practices that protect workers, clients, and the environment. Whenever possible, existing building components are reused on site or locally sourced. They resource reclaimed products that are then purchased. Anne researches all areas of environmentally conscious construction from cutting edge technologies to old time formulas for her home made natural building products. As I mentioned, Anne was also the winner of our uh, Sustainable Business Forum essay contest last year. And she finds that writing helps her to clarify uh, the personal values that she brings to her professional life. So please help me welcome Anne back to the podium. Thank you, Jennifer. Constructive dissent. Viewing a Chagall painting is like stepping into another universe. Lovers float over sleepy villages, giant birds perch on barns, clocks sprout wings, and smiling horses dance with purple fiddlers. Chagall's pictorial world is romantic, vibrant, exotic, visionary, fantastic, and above all, joyful. During his lifetime, Marc Chagall saw poverty, persecution, revolution, world wars, and genocide. Still, a love of life shines through his art. His work becomes even more precious when one learns how close the world came to losing him at mid-career. In 1941, Marc Chagall was already a famous artist. He was also a Jew, known for his Jewish themes in his paintings. Like thousands of other Jews, he found himself trapped in southern France as the Nazis began rounding up Jews and placing them in internment camps. Chagall was arrested and detained by Nazi sympathizers in Marseille. He was released after Hiram Bingham IV, the United States Vice Consul in Marseille, pleaded his case. Soon after, Bingham issued a visa to Chagall even though the artist lacked the requisite documents and did not meet the official U.S. immigration criteria of the time. Bingham helped to hide Chagall and his wife until they secured safe passage to the United States. After his escape, Chagall painted, sculpted, and produced stained glass windows for another 44 years. Bingham and Chagall remained lifelong friends. Between 1940 and 1941, Hiram Bingham IV was personally responsible for issuing between 2,500 and 5,000 visas, both legal and illegal, to desperate refugees in Marseille. He secretly worked with the French underground to smuggle refugees out of France. At great risk to himself, he sheltered Jews and anti-Nazi activists in his own home. If needed, he paid their expenses out of his personal funds. At the time, the US State Department actively discouraged diplomats from helping refugees. Bingham was one of the few who defied his superiors. Not long after he helped Chagall escape, the State Department figured out what Bingham was doing. They abruptly transferred him to a less desirable post in Lisbon and then to an even, even less desirable post in Buenos Aires. There, he further rankled his superiors by calling attention to the growing number of Nazi war criminals finding safe havens in South America. In 1945, Bingham was passed over for, for promotion. Disillusioned, he resigned the State Department. It took over 60 years for the State Department to recognize Bingham's heroism. Finally, on June 27, 2002, U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell, in conjunction with the American Foreign, Foreign Service Professionals Association, issued a special posthumous constructive dissent award to Hiram Bingham IV. An award for constructive dissent is a fitting tribute to, for someone who risked so much in the name of compassion and morality. The award could have been dreamed up specifically for Bingham, but happily, it was not. 
The American Foreign Service Association has given out annual Constructive Descent Awards to Foreign Service per personnel for over 40 years. It is the only U.S. government group to do so. According to the American Foreign Service Association, these awards publicly recognize individuals who have demonstrated the intellectual courage to challenge the system from within, to question the status quo and take a stand, no matter the sensitivity of the issue or the consequences of their action, actions. It is both admirable and remarkable that the American Foreign Service Association has the courage to reward dissent in the entrenched bureaucracy of a U.S. government agency. Businesses would do well to follow the Foreign Service Association's lead. Organiza organizations develop rigid systems with norms, policies, protocols, rules, and habits that tend to reinforce themselves. Blind obedience becomes the default position. Organizations traditionally punish all deviations from the norm. However, deviance can be positive when guided by conscience conscience and virtue. Individuals who deviate from organizational norms in favor of human virtue need to be encouraged and emulated rather than silenced and marginalized. Every corporation, agency, government entity, school, club, and institution should present an annual award for constructive dissent. Promoting virtuous behavior can actually pay off for businesses and organizations. In his book, Positive Leadership, Strategies for Extraordinary Performance. Kim Cameron outlines how empirical evidence shows that rewarding virtuousness is good for business. Cameron use, often uses the phrase positive deviance, but he could easily have called it constructive dissent. There are many virtues demonstrated by the players in the story of Hiram Bingham IV. Bingham himself embodies courage and conscience. Chagall personifies optimism and originality. The American Foreign Service Association exemplifies wisdom and creativity. The association itself deviates from the norm by rewarding those who deviate from the norm. Hiram Bingham IV never lived to see his own vindication. He retired quietly to his family farm, seldom talking about his days in Marseille. He spent his final years tinkering, playing music and painting. Many of his paintings are bright, modern pieces depicting mythical and fanciful scenes. Bingham's artistic style shows the obvious influence of the great Marc Chagall. Thank you.